library, you probably think of that place where you go to check out books. But when a biochemist hears the word library, we're more commonly thinking about either a sequencing library or some sort of screening library, like a compound library, or a guide RNA library, or shRNA library. Something that we can use in order to kind of search a wide variety of molecules or a wide variety of targets to find some initial hits um, and hints at to, as to what might be going on in cells or what molecules might make good drugs for various purposes. And so with the sequencing library, what we're doing is we're trying to actually characterize that library itself. Whereas with the screening library, we're using the library as a tool. So for these sequencing libraries, what we're talking about is basically if you want to sequence the DNA of some organism or you want to sequence their transcriptome, you want to sequence the RNA, see which proteins are being expressed. So which um, basically what the DNA gene gets made in messenger RNA copies of that get made and then those copies get used to make protein. And so by measuring your copies, you can get an idea about what proteins the cells are making when. So what genes are they expressing? by measuring the levels of those various messenger RNAs. But these messenger RNAs are really long, their DNA is really, really long, and so in order to sequence them with some sort of next generation sequencing platform like Illumina that uses short reads, what you do is you actually break it up into smaller pieces, sequence those individual pieces, and then overlay the sequences, find the connecting parts, piece them all together to get an idea of the whole picture in the case of the genome. Or for the messenger RNA, maybe you don't need the entire copy, you just want to see how many copies of, of the gene there are, of the transcript there are overall. But in any of these cases, you're going to have to prepare these little fragments and then you map it to like the overall picture of the reference genome. If you have one, if you don't have one, then you're like constructing a genome, then you really need to have those overlapping pieces, which you typically use a longer read sequencing for that too, that you can then layer these smaller reads on. But anyway, going back to the small reads, you're gonna have to add adapters to those reads and those adapters are going to then allow them to be sequenced. And typically what you do when you add these adapters is you also add on a barcode. And this barcode is really helpful because it's going to allow you to identify the where which sample a, which sample one of those pieces came from. So what you can do is you can pool samples together. So you take samples from um, some from one cell say and another um, one cell population and another cell population and then what you do is you add these adapters onto the ends um, as well as those unique um, barcodes and then you can pull those together and now when you go to sequence them you sequence them all together so you save space and you save resources because those sequencers can give you tons and tons more reads than you would need from a, one of those single populations so by pulling them together, you can then sequence them all together. The sequencer is totally capable of that. And then you just have to computationally separate them out based on the barcodes. And so we call it multiplexing when we pull these together and then we demultiplex them and um, take those barcodes and separate the reads with one barcode from the reads with the other barcode. And then we can compare the level, say, of things in one of the groups versus the other. And so the barcoding and this library is going to be very, very helpful. So when we're talking about the library, we're typically talking about those smaller pieces that have the adapters on them that's going to allow them to um, bind to the sequencer and get sequ make lots of copies and get sequenced and all that stuff. And so that library is going to be the collection of those kind of like pre pre-processed pieces um, pre that have those adapters and then the barcodes and everything that's going to make them ready for the sequencer. So that is a sequencing library. What about a screening library? So a screening library, there are multiple types. So one of the most common types is going to be a compound screening library where you're kind of trusting drug-like molecules. You probably have some sort of high throughput screening system. Some think some sort of like robotics. And so you have these like plate handling robots that are gonna dispense liquid into diff different wells, um, maybe out of a plate that contains a library of molecules. So it has all these different molecules. And these molecules might be really diverse or they might be more targeted. So maybe they all have a specific chemical group and then the rest of the, the drug is going to vary greatly. Or maybe it's just like approved drugs. And so you're trying to kind of repurpose other drugs. And so you want to see, okay, well, we have all these drugs. What, what can they, can they work for this other condition? And so you have some sort of assay, you have some sort of experiment with a readout that will allow you to tell, is that drug having the effect, some sort of effect on these cells? Is it having some sort of, is it binding? Is it doing this various thing? So some sort of readout that you can then test in this high throughput manner um, to see like, well, which, which of these might work 
And when you get those might work things, those like leads or those hits, then you turn to like optimization. Um, and so you take that compound that probably worked. Well, first you have to verify that it actually did work. So you want some sort of orthogonal assay. So some sort of like other test to make sure it really worked. Um, and then you can further modify that molecule to make it work better. Maybe give it better drug-like properties, get it into cells better, get digested better, or get like be soluble and all this various things. But there's so many molecules out there that we don't know that perfect one already from the beginning, but we kind of limit ourselves if we only think about what we know or what we think might work. Um, biology can often surprise us, and although there are a bunch of tools and things to help predict what drugs might bind and what might have what function, a lot of it is still really empirical. So it's like trial and error and test and see. And these large screens allow you to test a large variety of like chemical space, so a lot of different things at the same time. Sometimes what these screens can be aided um, by, instead of looking at this whole molecule, which may or may not bind, say maybe one part of it though would bind really really well but the other part is just getting in the way or it's doing things what you can do is a fragment screen and so instead of taking like whole druggy molecules you take parts of druggy molecules these like um various fragments and then you can see which fragments bind and you get multiple fragments binding you can kind of connect them together especially if you have a structure that you can kind of dock those fragments into or maybe you have a structure of them bound to the fragments and then you can kind of see okay well there's a space over here i can kind of connect them this way and in this way you can improve the binding and maybe improve other sort of properties so those would be like compound screens so it's like drug screens and like fragment screens there are also like genetic, so sometimes those work great for these stable molecules, um, various drug-like compounds that you can basically order these screens on or you can make your own like smaller screens on um, various things like this and you have these big, these companies can have these big stocks of them and they kind of like aliquot out different portions so you can buy a portion of this library or, or like buy a small amount of the library and things like this. But what if you have something that's less stable? What if you want to think about like a binding of a protein or an antibody? In this case, you kind of made, you can't just let things sit around for years. Instead, you need to kind of make things more on demand. And a way that we can do this is with the phage display library. Here we take phages. So these are viruses that infect bacteria. And what we do is we make it so that each of these phages is going to display or kind of put on its surface one of its surface proteins is going to have sticking off of that a protein that we want it to display. So this could be a protein, this could be um, a various, like a smaller part, like a peptide or something like this. And then what you do is you kind of select for the phages that will bind to a very, to like a surface. And then you do washes and you reselect and so you're enriching for the phages that are actually displaying that protein that is able to bind. And this is going to allow you then to find proteins that will bind. Um, and so this is used in a lot of different techniques, and I have a whole post on that. But this is going to allow you to then do a screening technique with a more less stable molecule. And what's really cool is that at the end of that, you can go back and you can sequence the phage. Once you find the, phage, the proteins that bind the best, you can sequence the sequence of the phage that is making that protein to figure out what protein it was making. Which brings up an important point about with the library, it's really helpful if you have some way to reference back to what, what the molecule corresponded to. So in the case of the one of those like drug screens, you're typically just relying on what well the drug was in or what where in the plate the drug was in. But there are also techniques that are coming about for like um, genetically um, tagged molecules. So basically like you have these DNA tags, these barcodes on various molecules and then you can actually sequence the molecules. Um, so various things like that that are really cool. And then with the case of the sequencing libraries, you have those sequencing barcodes so that you can multiplex, pull samples together and then um, separate them computationally. So like demultiplex them. Another sequence-based method is going to allow for screening and to see what genes or that sort of thing have effects on what processes and what kind of cells and all this very things. There's lots of questions that you could answer by either reducing the expression of a gene, such as with an RNA interference library, or by actually knocking out a gene altogether. So with like removing, preventing the cells from making any of that protein in the first place. You can do these diff two different strategies, a knockdown, where you reduce the expression by targeting the messenger RNA copies. So you can use um, like a, 
RNA interference. So you can use libraries that have siRNAs or libraries of shRNAs, um, small hairpin RNAs, and these can get processed into these um, siRNA guides that a protein called Argonaut can use to go and target messenger RNAs that match the sequence of that guide or that are complementary to that sequence, and then to get those sequences degraded. So you're reducing the expression, you're reducing the making of the protein from a various transcript, so from the messenger RNA. But you're not touching the gene itself, and so this is just reducing levels and not permanently. If you want to knock out a gene, well here you're going to actually prevent the cells from making any of the protein permanently, and you can do this with the CRISPR guide, um, CRISPR Cas system. In this case, the CRISPR, the, the Cas protein, the one that's going to have the scissors, it's going to go and it's going to cut the DNA, not the messenger RNA, and so it's going to permanently knock things out. And you target it by putting in a guide RNA, and so the guide RNA is going to tell the Cas protein where to go and cut. And in the case of the RNA interference, the, the siRNA or the shRNA that gets processed into these mature guides is going to tell Argonaut where to go and shut down the transcript. So in both of these cases, we have these RNA guides that can direct the machinery to various targets. And so if we can make a library of those guides, we can then selectively, we can then test a wide variety of targets and see which targets have what effect. And so typically what's done is these Say you want to do one of those CRISPR screens. You can take a library corresponding to a bunch of those different guide RNAs, and you can clone it into a lentiviral system. Um, so basically you take all these sequences and you stick them, um, you make them stick into this virus, this lentivirus that's actually going to carry that guide into cells. And then you infect a bunch of cells so that each of the cells is gonna get one lentivirus and each lentivirus is going to have a guide RNA that targets a different gene. And now what you can do is you can let those, so let the cells get infected and then have some way of separating the cells with various properties. So maybe you have it so that if something important is knocked out, then those cells will die. And then you want to see, okay, well, which cells died, um, which cells, which sequences are now missing if I only look at the live cells, or which cells survive, which means that this sequence might isn't necessary for survival, at least under these conditions. And you can imagine testing a bunch of different conditions, and you can also have various reporters. So maybe instead of looking at live versus dead, you can look at how much of the GFP are they making, um, and then kind of use flow um, sorting to separate the really high GFP, the high fluorescing ones from the low fluorescing ones if you have some sort of a reporter. There's all sorts of different experiments that you can do based on these initial screens. And so these screens, once again, can be really targeted. So maybe you, want, you know a certain pathway is involved in the process. And so you want to target each of the genes in that, that's known to be involved in that pathway. Or sometimes they're more broad. So maybe we want to knock out everything because we're really not sure what is actually involved. And so with any of these cases, you're typically using multiple guides and you want to validate it after you find that initial hit, similarly to how we want to validate it, that a drug actually is having some effect based after we get a hit from that initial experiment. So different types of libraries. Um, we have the screening libraries that we were just talking about. So the compound libraries, the, um, the fragment screens, these um, these guide, these CRISPR libraries, these siRNA libraries various things where we can actually use these libraries as tools to test a lot of different things at once, um, often in a high throughput manner. So with like robots and things like this, allowing us to do a lot more things than we could do with just manual pipetting. And then we have the sequencing libraries, which are we're kind of characterized themselves, which are basically corresponding to the whole um, of a the genetic information that's available, but that's broken up into smaller pieces that are adapted to be sequenced. And then we can sequence those smaller pieces and map them back to where they actually come from or to piece them together in order to do like a de novo genome assembly. So basically take those pieces and link them up in order to figure out what the actual DNA was rather than figure out based like how many copies of these various genes were being made at a time, which you can do if you have the transcript or you already know the genome and that you can map it back to. But so those are sequencing libraries and screening libraries. Um, there are also some other times that we might see the word library used, like a cDNA library, where basically you take the messenger RNA, you make complementary DNA, you stick those into plasmids, so bacterial um, circular pieces of DNA that can replicate in bacteria. And this is going to allow you to have a more stable um, 
source of the transcriptome, so all that messenger RNA that was present, as well as make lots and lots of copies of it. And then you can do things like fish out various messenger RNAs, see which versions of transcripts are getting made. You can um, take the cDNA and you can make, then um, like subclone it into another vector. You can make protein from various things like this. So that would be another type of library. But typically when you hear the word library, you're typically thinking either sequencing library or some sort of screening library. Um, either of these cases, it's typically a lot, a lot of molecules, sometimes with barcodes that are going to allow you to then um, kind of identify those molecules. Um, and yeah, sometimes you just identify them based on where they were and in which well or something like this. But as the technique evolves and we get more and more high throughput, um, there's more and more interest in kind of making everything barcoded in some way. So hope that helps and yeah, happy, happy uh, looking in that library. Thank you.